Wait a minute. Let me get my. <laughs> Your right stance? Yeah. Okay. You got that? Yeah, everybody. This is, oh, we're not supposed to smile either. Sorry. First time I saw an 88 truck was in 1972. And. <laughs> that's the kind of vision. I'm going to treat you That's the kind of visions I have. I'm going to treat you with a hostile witness. <laughs> Full size Chevy. No wonder, when it comes to pickups, America's having a change of heart. The heartbeat of America! Jason! You know about Boyd Coddington? Oh, yeah, Boyd Coddington. He built some nice hot rods, and this guy would, in his southern accent, went, Trucks too! Trucks too! I mean, that was like, it was the funniest thing when the guy said it, but, I mean, he was known for his hot rods, but some people knew about the trucks, you know. And the, the more he did these trucks, the more they got out there, they were just like blown away with it. You know, that was the best thing since fucking, since chopped bread or whatever they say. You know, I was born into this. I mean, I, you know, from the time I was 15 years old, my dad had me on a machine. And that's right about the time, and you know, around 90, when the wheel business started to take off, the sport truck movement started to take off. So, you know, my whole professional life and it was, has been building wheels. I really can't remember the very first 88 truck I did, but I would say probably what got the motor, the motor going here, and it was probably all the trucks I did for Bell Tech and with Tom Taylor. And then we were working in conjunction with Boyd, even though we didn't work with Boyd. Um, yeah, because we were doing, I mean, Tom was doing some wild stuff in the early 80s, late 80s trucks, and so uh, and I gotta give I gotta give credit to Bruce McCoy from the drop shop too. I mean, you know what? I mean, we did every one of his trucks just about, and, and every one was a cover shot, and he went all out, and he was a promoter, man. What influences more, uh, as far as from a graphic design standpoint, is what's going to be the ultimate use of the vehicle. Is it going to be for commercial use? Is it going to be strictly for family fun and vacations, or as, as, a, as a runabout? It, it don't. That, see, that's that's really. Where, 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 the, where the design themes come from. Yeah, one of the trucks that stands out was uh, the ZR1 pickup my dad built, and it held ZR1 drivetrain on it. I remember the first day he, he brought it home from the shop, and he said, get in, let's go for a ride. And I mean, that frame was on the ground, and we pulled out of the driveway, which isn't very steep, and that thing was scraping out. And you know, I was young at the time, I was probably 16, and I said, man, you know, and uh, you know, we got on the road, and he nailed it, and I mean, just shifting through the gears. That thing was awesome. That was a great. That was a great truck. You know? I mean, the Boyd look was different than anybody else. Boyd was, his his motto was less is more. But Bert had some good ideas, and he and he he did a lot of nice trucks. Um, he wasn't afraid to cut and weld and move things around where most people they just wanted to be able to bolt something on and and, and go, you know. Just like anything else, everybody's looking for the easy way out. But, but in order to take it a step farther, you had to you had to do that stuff. You had to cut things and move them around and shorten them up. And yeah. and that's and that's the difference between most of the people and Boyd. Even today's trucks, they don't they don't have the appeal of them trucks. When when them trucks when you did them right, that was a good looking truck. I mean, even the earlier trucks, the '70s trucks before that, the early '80s. That's still a good looking truck too, but there's something about that 88, 88 to 98 truck, they, I mean, they changed them a little bit here and there and along the way, but that truck overall is a good looking truck. When you get it to sit right, just the stance on that thing, it, they're good looking trucks, you know. But you had to do the right things to them. You could do them, and, it's, and then the guys got carried away. They would take and make a roll pan with Corvette tail lights in it, and, and they just, people just got crazy. And, and that's the stuff that, that I think kind of ruined it because, because now everybody was doing it, you know, and people were, people with no taste at all were making parts and pretty soon it was just like, it, it was, it was too much. Yeah. I mean, for me, custom cars were always around and my dad always had something cool that he drove and, and you know, in the early 80s, it was, it was a cool Chevy pickup, you know, lowered and, you know, with cool paint job and, and wheels that he actually made right here in this garage. So, you know, for me, by the time it started to pick up, when the new body style came out in 88, it was, uh, you know, it was, in, it was interesting because was, it was all, it was brand new. And this was the dawn of made to order parts, customizing of these cars. And 
uh, you know, the, the billet wheel boom. It brought to light the biggest selling vehicle that Detroit has, and the reason why those vehicles sold the way they did was because the one thing Americans know how to do is make trucks. If we're talking everything from heavy duty equipment to, you know, to dread something like the Panama Canal or whatever, to a light duty vehicle for like a florist shop to maybe an SUV so people can take their kids to school or whatever. It reminded people, it, it reminded people that, that Americans can do the proper vehicle if given free reign to manufacture that, that type of vehicle. In my graphic sense, I've always been a believer of don't be disappointed in three years from now when you walk in your garage and go, gosh, I wish I wouldn't have done that. So, and, and Craig Frazier one time called me a linear graphic person, which to me that was a compliment. I always believed things started here and went that way, you know, beginning to end, and compliment. I mean, sure, there was those vehicles that were show vehicles and promotion vehicles that just had to hit you in the face. And I mean, there's bells and whistles and dog and pony shows going off. But for the most part, for my clientele, the guy that drove his dually to the rear in the weekend, you know, or they went to the truck jamborees or whatever it was, they had to see their truck every day. And, you know, when you're spending that kind of money back then, you obviously, most guys could not afford to redo it in three to five years again to stay with the trend. So I try not to be too trendy. I was greatly influenced by Billy Carter um, and even Billy B and, and Dick Vale. Um, I always loved the drag boat graphic thing. and. Uh, um, so I kind of just follow suit. I mean, to me, if you if you stole anything from Billy Carter, you're stealing from the right guy. And I don't care about the rescue painters that say I never stole any of them crap. Um, we all stole, borrowed, influenced, whatever you want to call. It. You know, you you would always say, look what I came up with. You know, but when you went to a truck show or a car show, man, or a magazine came out, you knew. I mean, I can show you my cheat book. I got clippings of pieces of artwork from other people's cars pasted everywhere because we all need that kick in the butt sometimes when it's 10 o'clock at night and you go man I got to get on this thing tomorrow and I don't even have a design for it yet. Uh, the trucks came out and he that thing just took off and he goes he got me I was doing all the, the lowering me and a, another guy uh, Larry Surjoff who was a boy's normal chassis guy he designed all the A-arms and all that stuff and I would build them and install them and stuff but you know so then I went to California Street Rods from there and still was doing trucks, you know, the truck was still going on. So we were doing all the Chevrolet trucks from, from Chevy would bring us and we would do them for SEMA. So more like concept ideas on Concept their, ideas, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we would have, I mean, there was several different artists, Steve Stanford, Chip Foose, and Chip Foose at the time, he would come in, he was still in, in school learning how to draw. And he didn't have a shop, and he didn't have a. He, his father was building cars, but Chip was a, a kid in art school. I don't think he was. I don't think Chip was he, uh, 20 years old, and he would come in and he would do these drawings for us, uh, concept drawings, and then we would carry them out and, and build the trucks and and send them to SEMA. Well, the first thing I thought about was was the uh, the famous uh, 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 pickup that Tom Taylor and and, and Pete Santini uh, collaborated on with the. Uh, the, the, the progressive graphics, you know, the, the scallops. It was basically, I, I, like I mentioned earlier about this whole hot rod theme, it was one of the first vehicles to kind of roll out that whole trend. And of course, it, it coming out looking as, 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 as nice as it did. Now all of a sudden you get people like, like uh, Brett Michaels or, or, you know, the Van Halen brothers, whoever, they want, a, you know, a really cool looking pickup with, you know, with, 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 the, with that, uh, um, with that whole theme, that whole vibe, that whole, uh, uh, I don't know, just cool hot rod look. When that body style hit, it was right around the time the CNC machining started, started to take off and my dad started to do different designs and billet wheels and it was, it was one of those eras where, you know, before then you had center lines, you know, everybody had those, you had, uh, you know, American Racing wasn't doing anything cool in the 80s, you know, Western, we all these guys, they always carried the same wire wheels and all, all these same Me Too wheels, and, you know, it was an opportunity for somebody to take their 88 to 98, lower it, and, and at, that, at that point in the beginning, to me, there was only six designs, but by the time 9091 rolled out, there was probably 20 or 30 designs, and it was, it was something, especially with the way the dealerships were, were, were uh, jumping on the sport truck, uh, movement 
they were able to put 10 different vehicles on the lot with 10 different wheels. And it, it wasn't a major operation for us to supply them with that. Because in the beginning, we only made wheels for the hot rods that we, that we did. Up until about 87, 88. And that's when Budnick jumped on board with Boyd. And they decided, hey, why not sell these wheels to the public? You know, but that's when it went from knockoff to bolt-on. And we, we tried many different wheel caps, like the, the center caps. I remember we had one we called the titty cap. It was just a round bubble. And, but, but the original ones had that hex nut, you know. In 88, um, he opened up the, the muscle car shop at the end of the, on Electric Avenue where the wheels were being built. And we did uh, just nothing but trucks. We did trucks one after the other for GMC Truck Center. Well, the main one was at Boyd's when we did the top chop on that pink truck for Lynn Pugh, and they wanted the whole truck painted pink. It was like hot pink with white stripes and silver and stuff. I mean, the truck, nowadays you looked at it, you'd just go, God, that was an 80s truck for sure, you know. Lynn Pugh was a hot rodder, and he seen what Boyd was doing with these trucks, and he had to have one, but, but his couldn't be just a normal lower job and some wheels. He had to have the top chopped and the custom roll pan made and the door handle shaved and I mean all this stuff they had to have it all and and once we did Lynn's truck Lynn just said hey let's just start putting these things on I mean people are coming out of the woodwork wanting these slower trucks so we put them on the uh, we went and got it and they put them right on the showroom and, and sold them right on the uh, dealers lot and the showrooms and then pretty soon all the dealers were jumping on board I mean, you could go down here, any one of these Chevy dealers, they'd have four or five lowered trucks out in the front. Not all done by Boyd, but all done, you know, by that time, Belltech started making all the parts. And But like I said, in the beginning, there was no Belltech drop spindles or flip kits or nothing like that. Everything was hand fabricated. We, we cut plates and I remember making cardboard templates and then cutting it into a plate and then We'd cut that out on the bandsaw, and then we'd uh, cut the tube, and then we'd weld it all together. And and uh, and I was still learning at the time. I mean, I didn't really understand a lot of it. I knew how to weld, and I knew kind of what I was doing. But even the fabricating the parts, sometimes I'd grab mild steel plate and start cutting it. And Larry, the chassis guy, would go, "Whoa, whoa, 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 whoa! We gotta have this 4130. You can't, you can't be cutting." I go, "Ah, fuck! I, it's gonna be fine, you know." Oh my gosh, we, we were doing at least one truck a week for them, let alone whatever else is coming through. I was just, and, and it was amazing, I mean, again, I was really blessed, I guess, with an imagination or, or endurance or whatever you want to call it. I would, I very, um, I'll show you some of my sketches, like, uh, pre-computer days, but I mean, for the most part, it was just grab a roll of tape and go, you know. We actually, as a shop, Way back then, we were actually doing lowering here too. We were we, we were an account of Beltex and a lot of other manufacturers, so we were able to offer roll pans and all that stuff. We know we weren't doing it as much as the big guys, but through that, we literally, I helped set up the truck shop at Massey Chevrolet and at DeLillo Chevrolet. Uh, we were great influences there. We went in and, and showed them, you know, what they should stock. I got them set up with, you know, Weld Wheels and Beltech and all those guys back then. You know, help them design the the, the 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 setup and the you know what kind of truck should represent what they have, and then we were actually doing some trucks for them, and you know, uh, and Delillo really got into it because uh, a guy named Wayne Barger was in charge of that, and and Wayne was a gearhead, and so he let us do some really cool theme trucks, the '57 Chevy truck, the '62 Chevy truck, you know, those kind of trucks, and they were pretty big influences. Uh, you can always tell when one of your vehicles is an influence because you see it poorly done somewhere. Uh, on the freeway one day like two years later you know uh, I would say again because of and maybe just because of uniqueness not because I really liked it myself uh, when we when Tom Taylor and I started messing around with the computer generated masks to do these wild shredded falling apart exploding paint schemes that nobody's ever seen before and again, this is way before computers were, you know, household word. word. Uh, I think the turquoise and magenta shredded Belltech truck just blew everybody's mind at SEMA that year. And, and even at the truck dam, everywhere it went. I mean, 
they had to stand people around this truck to protect you because people were going trying to peel off or pick off because there's no way you can paint this. It's too intricate. Okay, there's too much going on. Couldn't imagine how they do it. Remember when we did Cadzilla, the er Erickson drew that car with a big wheel in the front. And that wheel on Cadzilla was still a 15 inch wheel, but the front face of the wheel was like, I think like an 18 inch. So they had a 15 inch tire and the wheel, the tire had to come on from the back side and then the wheel covered the front of the tire and it made it look like low profile tire because the wheel covered up most of the tire. But it was still a 15 inch tire coming on from the back side of a 15 inch wheel with a front face that was 18 inch in diameter. And that kind of gave it that look and I think that started a lot of that big wheel thing, you know, but but uh, then the factory started coming up with bigger and bigger and bigger every year and I remember the 17s were huge, you know. 16s really didn't do a lot, I don't think. It went from 15 and then 17s like were huge. And then pretty soon there were 18s and and then but there was a lot of tire sizes available in 17 inch. Um, when you got to the 18s, you were pretty limited on tire sizes, and then they got to 20s, and geez, I lost track after that. I don't even know. I've never had anything bigger than a 20, and I don't think I ever want nothing bigger than a 20. I mean, it's just not not in my... And I can tell you one thing, Boyd Jr. and Boyd Sr., that's where they would have fights, because Jr. wanted to go with the flow. He wanted to go bigger, 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 and spinners and all that shit, and Boyd was stuck in... You don't need all that shit, Junior. 17 inches, as big as we need to go. Granted, their early billet thing, they were kind of feeling their way along, but when they went to the more um, molded cast look that that was a little less chiseled, you know, that, that to me opened up the whole, and then the, the increased diameter, because now all of a sudden, they went from like a 15 or a 16 inch wheel to what they got now. I mean, granted, it's possible today to go too far, but what I'm saying is, a, a, a truck is a, is a larger vehicle and the wheels needed to be scaled up to proportion things correctly but because uh, I, I remember you know we've been involved in SEMA for longer than you were born but you know I remember back then even though they invite us to do their rigs for them they were not really aftermarket friendly people minded so it took years before we start seeing the influence of what was being done not just by me but every builder you know, with the billet grills, the grill changes, the smooth bumpers, the cutouts in the rear bumpers, uh, rear bumpers to look like roll pans, uh, better looking mirrors, uh, you know, all that approach. And then, you know, even the interiors. Is, I think the manufacturers finally realized, gosh, these guys aren't just putting manure in the bed of these things anymore, or lumber. They're driving their family to church on Sunday. So let's give them some console and this and that and bells and whistles and cup holders and. So, yeah, I think it's taken years for them to finally get in the bandwidth, but you can see the influence even today of the trucks we were doing 15 and 20 years ago. Like if you put a, a, a full-size short bed Chevy truck from 88 to 98 next to a today's truck, it looks like an S10 truck when they're lowered. I think it's a cool body style. I, I, per, I personally think it's probably my, it's my favorite of, of all the Chevy body styles. Um, and I just think there's... It's, we're at a time now where enough time has gone by and it, there's so, so much cool stuff coming out of the, the late 80s and, and, and early 90s that this is just a perfect truck right now to customize as, you know, if it's a classic truck, if you will, if enough time has gone by. You know, you know time has gone by when you start hearing Nirvana on KLOS, yeah. you know, <laughs> you know, Stone Temple Pilots or something, yeah. one of these 90s bands, you know, on KLOS, that's classic rock right now. We had a guy, there's a guy in the corner down here that swings those signs and we were driving, the guy's all, 1990s baby, you know. <laughs> I got one customer that, that I just did this uh, 90 454 truck. And, and back in 90, he bought one, but the 454 wasn't enough, so we took it out and put an LS6 454, which was like 450, 500 horsepower, something like that. And that truck was just wild to drive, man. We drove that. He drove it every day, and he loved it. But one thing led to another. He ended up selling it. And he came back to me now, what, a year ago, and said, uh, I want my truck back again. But he sold it to Japan, I think, or something. I said, well, let's do another one. So we did. We found another 454, and I did it actually nicer than this last one. But, but yeah, the guys are 
now they're now they're coming back for the second time around. You know, not only are they taking a new truck and doing it, now they're going back and getting the truck they had in '88 to '90 or whatever, and they're they want to do it again. Yeah, and actually, I have Eric Brockmeyer drawing me up a little short bed right now that we're going to feature our new wheels on. So we got a new concave profile that I'm trying to push and have those run those in the rear, standard profile on the front, and just just have something that's clean. But we want to make it handle and you know just have some fun with it. You know, don't. Don't think too hard about it, man. You know, what I mean, like I said, less is more. Just build a nice, streetable truck. You know, that you can have a little fun with. I really like the stuff that was that was going on. It was, in fact, I like to see a lot of that come back. You know, the whole wild and crazy. Let's custom paint. Let's let's experiment. But this time, like things that we knew was was in the experimental stage. Let's eliminate that. We've learned now from you know from from then, but still keep the. I guess what I'm saying is the spirit of those wild custom paint jobs from back then. I, we have a good time on that. If you were going to build one of these trucks today, how do you think you would have built it? Or how do you think you would build it? All black. <laughs> <laughs>